Okay, welcome back everyone. This is going to be the next video lecture on chapter 10.4. So, to move weight, the sacromeres have to shorten. And the force that's generated by that is called muscle tension. Muscle tension is also generated even when you can't move the load you're pushing against. So that's going to result in two types of skeletal muscle contractions. The first is the isotonic contractions, and the second is the isometric contractions. In isotonic contractions, the tension in the muscle stays constant, and a load is moved as the length of the muscle changes, or shortens. There's two types of isotonic contractions, concentric and eccentric. A concentric contraction involves the muscle shortening to move a load, and an eccentric contraction occurs as the muscle tension diminishes and the muscle lengthens. Here we see examples of the biceps brachii moving this hand weight up in a concentric contraction and down in the eccentric contraction. The second type of contraction is an isometric contraction, and that occurs as the muscle produces tension, but the angle of the skeletal joint does not change. Isometric contractions involve sacromere uh, shortening and increasing muscle tension, but the load does not move because the force that's produced can't overcome the resistance provided by the weight of the load. And that's our third example here at the bottom as we see the weight is just too heavy to move. And so this force is staying the same, it's increasing, but uh, this length, is, uh, this angle is not changing and the weight is not moving. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is the motor unit. Um, a motor unit is the actual group of muscle fibers in a muscle that are innervated by a single motor neuron. Um, and basically it's just what this, motor, what this motor neuron has an effect on. That entire thing is called a motor unit. The size of a motor unit is variable depending on the nature of the muscle. A small motor unit is an arrangement where a single motor neuron will supply a very small number of muscle fibers in a muscle. That's going to permit very fine motor control of that muscle. The best example I can give you is um, in the extraocular eye muscles that move the eyeballs. There's thousands of muscle fibers in each muscle, but for every six or so fibers, there's a single motor neuron. And that allows for the really exquisite control of eye movements so that both eyes can quickly focus on the same object. When you have small motor units, you're also going to be, uh, you're usually going to be involving many fine movements like fingers, thumb of the hand for grasping and texting. Um, when you have a large motor unit, that is the arrangement where a single motor neuron will supply a large number of muscle fibers in a muscle. Those motor units are usually concerned with gross movements and not it, as in gross as in disgusting, gross as in large. The one example I can give you is powerfully extending the knee joint. The best example is when the large motor unit of the thigh muscles or the back muscles, where a single motor neuron will supply thousands of muscle fibers. And so you can think of um, kicking out your leg, right? That is just a, a really big movement and it doesn't uh, call for very small, tiny, minute movements like moving your eyes around does. As more strength is needed to do something, larger motor units with bigger, higher threshold motor neurons are enlisted to activate larger muscle fibers. This increasing activation of motor units produces an increase in muscle contraction, and we call that recruitment. It's basically like recruiting what you think, right? It's getting more and more muscle, uh, muscle contraction involved. Uh, as more motor units are recruited, the muscle contraction grows progressively stronger. In some muscles, the largest motor units might generate a contractile force 50 times more than the smaller motors, uh, smallest motor units in the muscle. Um, and then I want to talk about the length tension range of a sacromere. When a skeletal muscle fiber contracts, we know that the myosin heads attach to actin to form these cross bridges followed by those thin filaments sliding over the thick filaments as the myosin heads pull the actin. That results in the sacromere shortening, creating the tension of the muscle contraction. Now, what we see on this graph 
is that the ideal length of a sacromere to produce maximal tension occurs around the 80% to 120% mark. 100% uh, is the state where the most tension occurs. That length maximizes the overlap of actin uh, binding sites and the myosin heads. Now, if we look and we see that a sacromere uh, is stretched beyond 120%, the thick and thin filaments don't overlap as sufficiently, and that results in less tension produced. And then on the opposite end, if a sacromere uh, is shortened beyond 80%, the zone of overlap is reduced and the thin filaments really have nowhere to go at that point and that also reduces tension. If the muscle is stretched to the point where thick and thin filaments don't uh, overlap at all, no cross bridges can be formed and, and you won't even get sacromere shortening at all, no tension will be produced. But that doesn't usually happen because there are accessory proteins and connective tissue that won't really, that, that won't allow that to happen. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is the frequency of motor neuron stimulation. Um, a single action potential from a motor neuron will produce a single contraction in the muscle fibers of its motor union. That, is called, that isolated contraction is called a twitch. You probably all felt a twitch in one of your muscles. Now, the, that twitch uh, doesn't produce any f real force. You can't do any real work. You couldn't lift a dumbbell if your uh, bicep twitched, correct? Um, you would need a, a, a more, sustained, um, tw more sustained twitches, but the length of a twitch varies between muscle types and it's, it can be measured using a myogram and it would give you this, uh, this graph right here where you actually measure the length of time that the twitch occurs. They occur in three phases. The first phase is the latent period. That's right here, a very small part of it, but uh, during this, uh, this latent period, the action potential is moving along the sacrolemma and the calcium ions are released from the SR. And so that's the phase during which excitation and contraction are being coupled, but contraction has yet to occur. Then, well, like it just says, contraction occurs during the contraction phase. Um, the calcium ions that are now in the sarcoplasm have bound to troponin. Uh, tropomyosin has shifted away from actin binding sites, cross bridges are formed, and sacromeres are actively shortening to the point of peak tension. And then the last phase is the very long relaxation phase, when tension decreases as contraction stops. Calcium ions are now pumped out of the sarcoplasm back into the SR. The cross bridge cycling stops and it returns the muscle fibers to their resting state. Although, like I said, you can experience a single muscle twitch, it won't produce any significant muscle activity in the living body. What you're going to need is a series of continuous action potentials to the muscle fibers um, to produce any muscle contraction that could produce work. The rate at which a motor neuron fires action potentials affects the tension uh, produced in the skeletal muscles. If the, uh, if the, so, if the fibers are stimulated while previous twitch is occurring, the second twitch will be stronger. So you can see right here, here's the first twitch, the second twitch is stronger, third and fourth, and we continue on until there's the resting phase where it falls. This response is called wave summation because the excitation contraction coupling effects of successful, I mean successive motor neuron signaling is summed or basically it's added together. And so you can see it basically doubles every time there's a successive uh, extension contraction coupling. If the stimulus frequency is so high that the relaxation phase disappears completely, contractions should become continuous in a process called uh, complete tetanus, and you'll hear this called physiologic tetanus because we all know there's a disease called tetanus, which actually does result in the same thing here, but we're talking about um, a, a tetanus that would end eventually, and so it's physiologic tetanus. Okay, last slide here I want to talk about when a skeletal muscle has been dormant for an extended period of time and then suddenly activated to contract and all other things are equal, the initial contractions will generate about half the force of the later contractions. And you can see that muscle tension will increase in a graded manner that comes to look like stairs. 
This uh, tension is actually called treppe, um, and that's actually just uh, German for stairs. So it's basically stair-like. Um, they, they sometimes call it the staircase effect. And basically what that means is that uh, every the first time that you uh, contract a dormant muscle, a muscle that's been dormant for a while, uh, every, every subsequent time you contract it, it will be slightly stronger. And then the last thing is skeletal muscles, when we say that they're relaxed, they're not completely relaxed or they're not flaccid. Um, even if a muscle is not producing movement, like your, uh, your hands are at your sides, it is, your muscles are contracted a small amount to maintain its contractile proteins and produce muscle tone. Um, you can see that muscle tone is defined as the tension in a muscle at rest. The tension produced by muscle tone allows muscles to continually stabilize joints and maintain posture. If you had an absence of low-level contractions that lead to muscle tone, that's referred to as hypotonia, and you would see that in certain diseases that produce hypotonia. And conversely, excessive muscle tone is referred to as hypertonia, and you'll see and read about other diseases that produce hypertonia. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave you with that one, and I'll see you next time.